Hey, welcome everyone. This is uh, the first student session of the DCMI 2021 conference. Uh, so we can get started here. Uh, and um, I want to just uh, thank everyone for being here and for participating. And we have uh, four presentations and each will present for four minutes and then we will, um, sorry, four minutes, I'm sorry. Each, of, each will present for 10 minutes and then we'll have Q&A uh, about for about five minutes in between. Uh, and we will start with um, the group from Kent State University in Baker and Taylor Publishing Services, R.P. Anderson, Kathy Berry, and Megan Calhoun. Uh, and on what do Ulysses S. Grant and a squirrel with an attitude have in common? So sounds great and take it away, folks. All right, hi everyone. Can you hear me all right? Awesome, okay. Uh, thank you for coming to our presentation about creating metadata standards for the Ohio Outdoor Sculpture Project. My name is Arby and I'm gonna start us off and then hand off to Megan and Kathy's gonna wrap up for us. We'd like to thank DCMI Virtual for the opportunity to present and Dr. Zhang for encouraging us to participate. The title of our presentation asks the question, what do Ulysses S. Grant and a squirrel with an attitude have in common? We see from these photos that while there are two very different concepts, both are outdoor sculptures and therefore qualified for inclusion in our database. So what is Ohio Outdoor Sculpture or OOS? It's a freely accessible online database of public outdoor sculpture in Ohio. Anyone can use the database to learn about works in their communities. And it's a tool for documenting works that have been removed or relocated. As far as we know, the database is unique in its attempt to inventory public works of this nature across an entire state. The database currently holds records for over 2,000 works, covering an area of over 44,000 square miles. It's hosted by the Sculpture Center in Cleveland, where our supervisor, Bill Barrow, is the chair of the Preservation Committee. Interns and volunteers for the project live and work all over the state. One of the unexpected challenges we encountered was deciding how to define outdoor sculpture and what to include. So most of us recognize a sculpture when we see one, but it isn't always obvious. And in the context of cultural heritage objects, outdoor sculpture often straddles the areas of both art and history. Sculptural works can be parts of historical markers and memorials and sometimes functional objects are repurposed as parts of monuments or works of art. For the purposes of our project, we devised the working definition you see here, a human created three-dimensional form intentionally made or repurposed to be an object of contemplation located outdoors and visible to the public. The origin of this project was the Save Outdoor Sculpture Program, or SOS, a nationwide survey in the 1990s that was committed to documenting and preserving America's outdoor sculpture. At the conclusion of SOS, the Sculpture Center assumed responsibility for the project and consolidated the records into the publicly available OOS online database. In 2012, it was migrated to the open source content management system, Omeka. A primary focus of the interns this year was to locate works in some of Ohio's more rural and underrepresented counties. The map on the left shows the coverage prior to January with records concentrated around a few major metropolitan areas. So far this year, over 800 sculptures have been added 
And the map on the right represents current coverage with far fewer unrepresented counties. The interns also reached out to various news outlets to raise community awareness of our project and solicit leads on works, resulting in more than 10 newspaper articles and a segment on a Cleveland PBS program called Applause. Thanks, Arby. So it's great that we're expanding this coverage and we're getting more of the state in there, places we weren't even sure had sculptures. But with thousands of items now in the database, we need to make sure that people can actually find what they're looking for. And that of course is where the metadata steps in. So there were a number of challenges that came with working with the metadata and OOS. For one, there was a lot of legacy metadata that came down from the original SOS and then several data platform migrations. And some of that legacy metadata was no longer used or its original intent had been lost in the ensuing decades. Compounding this issue, item records had primarily been created by interns and volunteers, many with no experience with metadata, working on a temporary and short-term basis, creating consistency issues with the metadata implementation. So the metadata needed cleaning up, but OS is a unique resource. Nobody out there is doing quite the same thing and finding an example to follow is difficult. We wanted to make sure that our standards would be easy for future volunteers and interns to understand and implement and that they would serve the needs of our primary user, the general public, but still have enough detail for anyone doing more in-depth research. The OOS site uses both Dublin core elements and a customized Omega item type element set called sculpture item type or SIT. At the beginning of the spring term, all of the elements for both sets were available for use, which was a total of 96 elements. At that time, there was no formalized standards for the use of these elements, which led to a lack of consistency in value formats. The list in the box shows example of the wide variety of date formats that had been entered for the Dublin Core date. This is one of the several cases in which a formatting rule was needed. Another major problem with the lack of standards was frequent disparity in how the elements were being used semantically. This box shows examples of some of the values that have been recorded for the sculpture item type element sculptor location. As you can see, the values entered cover a wide range of concepts, everything from the physical location of the sculptor's signature on the work to the geographical location of the sculptor's birth or residence, or even where the sculptor was buried. Simplifying the metadata for future volunteers was a major focus. We eliminated elements that had not been used, were deemed unnecessary, or reflected redundancies. This resulted in an overall reduction of the number of elements down to 44. Creating metadata specifications and standardizing how the elements were used was the next major step. Definitions and formatting rules have been developed and documented for all elements, and controlled vocabulary pick lists have been implemented for several of them. We did also create a few new elements like inscription to provide a place for information that previously was being entered under multiple elements. And we linked many of the elements in the Omega system in order to enhance users' browsing experience. Before our work on the metadata, many of the elements were hidden from public view on the site. We generally felt that if the information had been recorded, we should display it, unless the element's purpose was administrative. The use of controlled vocabulary lists is one way to ensure better consistency between records and having a list to choose from helps to make data entry easier and quicker. Searching and browsing are also made better since we've linked the terms in Omeka, making it easy for the user to sift through the records using elements like subject or type of sculpture. The lists were primarily developed by looking through existing record values and consolidating them into a meaningful collection of standardized terms. Controlled lists were created for five elements, the five elements as shown in the light gray box. The following slides show examples of some of the values created for vocabulary lists for three of those elements. The Dublin core type element was used to give a very broad category designa designation for the functional type of the sculpture. This is a good example of where it was helpful to have a large legacy data set to sift through. Without the existing records to seed the ideas, it would have been difficult to select values for this element. Once the basic categories were determined, 
the art and architecture thesaurus was used to choose the most appropriate terminology. Narrowing down the upper level of subjects was somewhat challenging, and the goal was to be thorough without creating an overly long and cumbersome list. Again, it was helpful to use old records to choose these values, which were also matched up with the art and architecture thesaurus terms. Sculptures are made from a wide variety of materials and it's not always easy to determine what exactly the material is. So for this list, there are both generic terms such as stone and metal, as well as more specific terms such as marble and bronze. Once again, the art and architecture thesaurus was used for term selection after first examining the old records. Here's a view of a record from the administrative side of Omeka. You can see the photo files associated with the record. The linked elements are shown in orange text. And here's the public view on the OOS website. Notice there's a larger main photo as well as a map of the sculpture's location. Linked elements are easily identified by the green underlined text. Metadata work is never done. There are decisions yet to be made on how best to record the condition assessment of a given sculpture, taking into account both the ease of data entry and how this information might actually be used. With the new standards in place, we now have the monumental task of updating existing records. Several values need to be moved or reformatted in nearly every record. We need a way to make this easy for new volunteers to step in and do this work. There are plans to change the website, which will better incorporate the metadata improvements and therefore create a better front end experience for users. Omeka will also get some upgrades on the back end to help with record management. We hope you enjoyed our presentation. Please visit the OOS website at the link provided and let us know what you think. And that's it. Great, thank you. Applause, applause. Uh, so uh, now we have time for questions from uh, any other panelists or um, our attendees. If you are uh, have a question as an attendee, you can, I think, raise your hand and I can um, enable you to talk. Otherwise, I think panelists can also raise your hand or on your video, whatever, or you can type your question into the chat. Um, so however folks would like to ask questions. Um, this is a great project. I, I have um, just a couple uh, kind of general questions about, you know, you mentioned date and subject and format, which are kind of classic Dublin core challenge points, I would say. Um, did you have, um, was, was the choice of which, ter which sort of terms you developed controlled vocabularies? Or, so, so I guess my question is, how did you decide which terms you would develop controlled vocabularies for and which ones you would kind of leave as more open-ended entry elements? I think one of the main motivations in that was, again, seeing the values that had been entered in the site. Um, you could see some places where things were making categories for themselves. And then were the stragglers where, where, they're, where they had like the location types and people were entering very similar types of places, but they're a little bit worded differently. And we saw that we could consolidate those sorts of entries and create a nice list that would be covering what everybody was wanting to enter, but making it more formatted in a better way so that people can actually search and use those terms consistently across all the sculptures. Right. And I think another thing I would add on to that is that um, there were some other fields that were uh, easier to not have to have controlled because uh, things were divided up like the lo for location. We have counties listed and and the city. So we didn't need like a format for that together because those elements were separated. So I think there are uh, several different things we have that are kind of separated out, which sort of create their own format in a way and didn't need a special list. 
there were some there were some things too with like the um for the dublin core uh type where type of sculpture could mean anything you can be talking about the kind of art is it abstract is it this you could be talking. there's all kinds of different types that would fall under there so we wanted to really kind of pick a type and we ended up with function like how is this functioning is it functioning as a fountain is it functioning as a grave marker and picking that type and then and then fostering that list around that so we weren't getting different sorts of types so when we saw inconsistency with the values that are being entered in that regards, trying to like just pick one area that we wanted to focus on. And we had some other things, we do have tags and things like that that capture some of the other outlying information. So those were a factor as well. Great. Um, one more question from me. Uh, how did you survey, like, so you said you're in Omeka. Um, how did you sort of survey the current state of the metadata? Um, did you use Omeka tools or did you use any other tools or did you just run reports or how, can, how, how, how did you figure out what was already there, I guess? There, there's a feature in Omeka that lets you, if you pick out one of the fields, it will populate, it'll tell you all the values that are currently residing in that field. What is what's not there is very good exporting features right now. That's one of the things they're going to work on on the back end. Um, that would help with a seeing what's in there and being able to really dig deep into the data. But then also, if you want to make massive changes, to being able to export and then import things back in there. So hopefully, that's coming up and will make things a little bit easier on that end. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, so I think now we can move to our, let's all thank uh, RP, Megan and Kathy again. Uh, and now we can, uh, our next presentation is a group from Syracuse University, uh, Grace Swinnerton, who is maybe Gigi, uh, is that you? Okay. Uh, Mohammed Ashmawi, uh, Heather Charlotte Owen and Bree Baumert. And they will be talking about maximizing interoperability through metadata. Uh, so take it away, folks. Sorry, having a little technical difficulty. Okay. Hello and welcome to Maximizing Interoperability Through Metadata, a student initiative. My name is Bree Baumert and I'm the current student lead of the Digital Resource Library Project, also known as DRL, at the Institute for Veterans and Military Families, the IVMF, in tandem with Syracuse University Libraries and the Syracuse University School of Information Science, the iSchool. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, Firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. Presenting today will be Gigi Swinnerton, Muhammad Ashmawi, Heather Owen, and Bree Baumert. But this project could not have happened without the support of other current and matriculated LIS and undergraduate students. What is the Resource Library Project? The DRL project is a cross-campus collaboration between the IVMF, Syracuse University Libraries, and the iSchool. The DRL itself is an index which visitors to the IVMF website can use to browse and find publications and research output from the IVMF, as well as certain external curated materials relevant to veterans and military family studies. The LIS graduate student team has spent close to two years analyzing and synthesizing the resources and information provided by the IVMF with descriptive DCMI metadata standards to establish a metadata application profile that would A, adequately fit all the existing content from the old IVMF website, which needed to migrate to the DRL, B, fit with Syracuse University's existing institutional repository called Surface, C, integrate consistency consistently and effectively with the additional database storing locally created records of external materials, and D, communicate well with the third-party vendor who is completing the structural design of the front-end website. 
The nature of this project was understanding system interoperability from the start and recognizing that with so many systems in play, there was going to be a lot of iteration, reiteration, edits, deletions, and moments we headed back to the drawing board. However, this is exactly what makes the Resource Library Project such a unique experience for an LIS graduate student. As part of our LIS education, we take an introductory course for metadata. Some of the major projects for this class include writing a metadata record for multiple varieties of objects, understanding MARC and RDF, and understanding the differences and usefulness of different metadata standards. This class was inherently beneficial for understanding existing and predetermined metadata schema. Similarly, many internships and work experiences for LIS students surrounding metadata involve working with the institutional metadata standards. While we were bound by finding a structure that worked for all of the previously mentioned systems, we were given the space and opportunity to explore on our own what we thought would work. Furthermore, in being involved in a project which is not yet public facing or live from the very beginning has given us the opportunity to see what our decisions impact on each system and how to reconcile these decisions. Additionally, the interaction between the back end system team and the front end website team gives us a unique experience of seeing how our work would display and assist a user of the DRL. The decision to use DCMI metadata standards was based around the accessibility and ease of use with all the interoperating systems. Since all IVMF publications will be housed in Surface, the institutional repository, communicating with the existing DCMI metadata in this repository made the most sense. However, the existing DCMI metadata didn't do all the description which the IVMF wanted to have on a publication. Some customized fields we've added included IVMF topic, which is a local controlled vocabulary and maps the DC subject, IVMF port, which delineates what collecting areas the item belongs in, and IVMF series, which contains a controlled vocabulary delineates that items should be grouped together and maps the DC relation is part of. In addition to these customized fields, we delved into exceptional circumstances with the DCMI, DCMI fields already in use in the institutional repository. This was a major area where we had a lot of back and forth between the third party vendor, Mindshare, the libraries, the IVMF content team, and our team. In some fields, such as creator, keyword, DC subject, and LC subject heading, DC subject, we ran into syntactic problems identifying what types of punctuation would be best for Mindshare to pull the metadata to the front end website. Similarly, the previously mentioned customized fields ran into several issues with determining what punctuation would make the most sense for the metadata being pulled over the exact way we intended it would be displayed. For example, IVMF topics changing commas to semicolons to not confuse the process of pulling over topics, which is commas within the term used. For example, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. One of the biggest hurdles was breaking out of the content types within the collection, which fit DCMI standards. The existing use of DCMI in Surface the IVMS understanding of the materials and the understanding of Mindshare as they build a front end facing filter system. Our most discussed metadata element was one which was essential for the organization of the information on the back end and the filtering of the information on the front end. We initially went about labeling the IVMF publications by the standards already in surface. However, it was quickly determined that this was not sufficient for describing the breadth of resources that the DRL would hold. As part of the back end organization, we met with both SUL and the IVMF to determine what types of documents the DRL would contain and how descriptive the IVMF wanted this metadata to be. Simultaneously, we were meeting with Mindshare to determine how this would display on the front end. 
Since the document type was frequently changing and Mindshare needed a data element that they could use to create front end iconography, we ended up building a crosswalk between DCMI type and the changing document types so that they would have a constant data point to draw from the DCMI type. Over time, as we solidified document type, DCMI type became less necessary for the web development, but this process continues to demonstrate to us system interoperability. So just to give a high level overview of the data integrations, uh, the IBMF resource library has two different types of publications. Internal publications, which are published by the IBMF and they are curated and stored at the SU and institutional repository servers that's managed actually by BPress system. And on the other side, we have the external publications, which are published by other organizations and they are curated through local forms that store the data in the Oracle database. So speaking of the Oracle database, as we can see here, it performs as the main repository for the internal and external publications metadata, as the team has created a middle layer of a middle layer of SAS application that uses BPRS APIs to retrieve the internal records metadata from servers and store it in the database along with the external records metadata that are entered manually. And eventually the Oracle database can feed the different front ends for different portfolios, such as entrepreneurship and employment collections with both internal and external publications records. So again, the interoperability here is in place by having two different data sources pouring data in one database. And as soon as there's no, there's any new records or updates on the item level, it will be automatically available on the proper front end. As a team, some of our key learning outcomes have been understanding the use and application of DCMI standards in metadata application, balancing system interoperability with the needs of a set of resources, and gaining an appreciation of the impact of metadata mapping on the user experience. This last learning outcome has been particularly meaningful since it has provided practical examples of what we learned in the classroom, blended with the front end reference, as well as further expanded our understanding of the extent to which all metadata data has an impact on the front end information seeking experience. Our next steps are continuing to solidify LIS principles in a new non-traditional environment through collection development opportunities, expansion of collection pages and mapping new content to metadata, and the creation and exploration of new LIS internship opportunities. As the IBMF's first LIS presence, we continue to seek new and innovative ways to apply our LIS skills to the needs of a non-traditional environment and in turn have expanded our own views of the potential of the LIS experience. We are grateful for the opportunity today to share with you our experiences. You can reach any of us at these emails here and thank you for your time. Hey, excellent. Applause, applause. Very nice presentation. Uh, really getting to live some interoperability, not just read about it in a class, but <laughs> experiencing what it really means. Uh, so uh, let's see if we have any, any questions from other panelists or our attendees. Uh, please go ahead and raise a hand in Zoom. Um, or I can ask my questions, but uh, give folks a chance to not just hear from me, I guess. Well, I'll wait a second, but in the meantime, I will ask my questions. Uh, so you mentioned this, um, use of DC type and kind of how important it was in the in the user experience as in terms of building that website. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about perhaps how you came to uh, realize the role of this uh, element and how and develop this strategy for dealing with it. Yeah, um, so it was real, it came down to being kind of the easiest thing. One of the things that I guess the IVMF team saw as being filterable. Um, so something that they thought, you know, our users would recognize this and would know how to use this. 
Um, so it actually started, I would say, on the front end before it even made its way back to back to us in the metadata itself. Um, however, it's it's become a very uh, contentious um, point, um, and it gets it uh, it does a lot in terms of talk, talking about. Um, uh, we're in a stage right now where we're just in the process of user testing currently. Um, and so what was happening was there was a lot of, because there were a lot of voices in the room, there was a lot of tendency to uh, try, try to extrapolate what the user would want to actually see in that document types list. Um, so we actually did something that was very similar to what um, Megan, Kathy, and Arpy's group did with uh, talking about type as a function. Um, it ended up kind of coming back to that uh, to that list. What does this item function as? And then there's also the conversation of having, you know, what exactly is a document type? Um, what exactly is a document even with uh, outside of the LIS community? Um, because they would always map that to content type um, almost unconditionally. Uh, so it really just um, came down to really the functionality of the items and getting a grasp on um, kind of a first pass of what they thought the users would actually use. Great, thank you. Uh, and that speaks, so my other question was sort of uh, what the, if you saw a particular kind of uh, um, influence of the IVMF as a uh, a partner here as, as, as maybe a less traditional LIS kind of partner uh, in this group. Uh, and yeah, Megan asks, who are the primary users? And so I would, you know, so kind of along those lines, how, what's, the, what's, what's the primary use case that you are working around? So it's a really good question to ask who the primary users are um, because there's a lot of them. Uh, you might think from Institute for Veterans and Military Families that they're veterans or military families. Um, however, it also involves uh, key, so some of the key stakeholders are also the funders of the work that we do, as well as um, employers of veterans and military families. Uh, that's a big collection that's being developed right now. Um, in terms of, I guess, LIS impact, in terms of what, what we hear from, from the IBMF, um, I, I am currently the IBMF's first librarian. Um, so that's part of the impact that's kind of come out of this project was uh, they, they saw fit to keep me around. <laughs> um, so ah, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Um, but because of that, we've been able to kind of start exploring new roads of what this, because it's, it's potentially going to be a very expansive library. Um, a very expensive index, I should say. Um, we've started to seek new roads of what librarianship means, um, because I think the biggest thing, and I don't, I don't think it's just unique to the experience that we've had, um, but the biggest thing is communicating everything that librarians are able to do, like the whole, the whole breadth of what we can bring to an organization and bring to organizing information, even. Um, and so that's been that's been the last two months, I guess, is that, that process, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that shows a real sort of um, potential of this kind of work and this sort of collaboration is that it's not just about the particular project, but also building that awareness of what uh, LIS can add and what librarians can add for an organization. We got a question from Marsha Zhang. Are the interoperability challenges more at the semantic layer like with control vocabularies for types or at the structure layer. So bringing it back to our interoperability theories here. What do you guys think? I, I'm going to keep taking these, Bree and Heather, unless you want to hop in. Um, I know Ash is on, but Ash, Ash is our student who's in Egypt. So his time difference is uh, a, bit more, a bit more, I guess. Um, but uh, I would say it's, I would say it's both. Um, we've had the most extensive conversations around controlled vocabularies um, because that seems to be something that is very fascinating from a user experience standpoint to 
um, non-traditional to a non-traditional LIS um, environment, I'd say. Um, however, there have been um, moments of there being issues with what we're pulling into, for example, Surface, which uses a B-Press backend, uh, which maps to B-Press. Um, what we're pulling into there doesn't fit what we have, what we've asked to be pressed to program into our institutional repository. So that's one example. Um, we've had a couple other examples where uh, the information that's getting pulled into our, our database for the external elements, as Ash mentioned in the presentation, um, what's getting pulled into the, that database, the string of information is too long um, or just doesn't fit anymore because so many things have been copy pasted. Um, we have a lot of WYSIWYG elements in our metadata, which creates a, a little bit of a nightmare. Um, so figuring out how to kind of narrow down those, those elements in a way that still provides that same level of user access, because at the very root of all of this has been kind of user who, how we're going to communicate this with the user. Um, so we've had, we've had both. Um, the ones that are more uh, ongoing are definitely more semantic, um, but we've had we've experienced both in the last couple months in particular. Okay, and I think we have I think we have one question from Tian Chin. Uh, we can do one more I think before we move on. So I think you should be able to talk now. Oh, thank you. Um... I'm so glad to see a few familiar faces from Syracuse. I'm so proud of you. Uh, congratulations on such a, a, a great presentation. And um, while I was hearing you talking about the project, uh, you're all uh, involved. And I started wondering um, about, you know, as an educator, I'm, I'm always interested in gathering what um, helped uh, you mo you the most uh, from what you have learned in your uh, program study, and because I thought you know the considerations and the uh, the rationale you described were uh, very well versed. So in in terms of metadata uh, considerations, metadata design. And in that way, so I was, uh, you know, very curious to learn what you think. Um, maybe I'll answer this question so Gigi doesn't have to do everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, um, I think um, within the classroom, I learned a lot about how metadata works and controlled vocabularies. But I think being able to use um, metadata at the IBMS, the one thing that, new thing that really I learned was thinking about the user. Um, Cause when I created metadata in the classroom, I'm thinking about it more as an organization tool. But at the IBMS, we're creating the website and we as students get to see the website being built. And so our metadata decisions are on how will, will the website use it? How will it be displayed? How will it help searchability? So for me, being able to work with the front end um, designers on this project, it kind of helped me really conceptualize metadata in a new way. I can jump in here too. Um, I have, I'm not well versed in metadata in my courses. I've taken one required course that's information organization. Um, and so for me, as a future academic librarian who wants to you know, do like reference work and instruction, I think it's so important to be like immersed in the metadata world too and have like a deeper appreciation for the work that's done, right? Like these things don't just show up and we're able to access them. Like there's, there's work that's being done there. And I think it's really helpful as students to be a part of that and, and like understand that and have a deeper appreciation going in to the, to the profession. So very thankful for this opportunity here. Thank you, that, that's very helpful. Um, you know, both from um, metadata and non-metadata career thinking. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. All right, so let's do another applause. And uh, thank you all. And next, we have uh, Irmarie Fraticelli Rodriguez, and she is going to talk about curating the Ricky Renuncia tweet data set. And welcome. Hello, are you able to see uh, my screen? Okay. Um, let me pull up my, okay. So, hello, I am Irmari Fraticelli Rodriguez. I'm a PhD student from the University of Michigan uh, School of Information. Um, so during my master's, uh, 2019 uh, to 2021, and now my PhD. I have been involved in a collaboratory project uh, recopilating documents about the Ricky Denuncia manifestation on summer 2019. I have worked with different types of resources, both physical media and digital born social media content. The team and I uh, receive an IMLS funding to collaborate with the University of Maryland Advanced Information Collaboratory Lab um, to generate educational computational experiences. So from a metadata standpoint, I propose within this project to utilize research description framework records to offer a user-friendly search engine or content management system that could allow them to experience and navigate an important historical incident as an experience, as experience by social media. Um, further control vocabulary and schemas could also be applied to offer filters and tag not included in the original tweet JSON. Um, so first of all, I will be giving a brief background on what the Ricky Renuncia incident is. And then I will be giving a brief background on the Ricky Renuncia project. And then we will going to talk more about uh, the RDF uh, schema, metadata schema developed for this. So on July 8, 2019, a Telegram chat with the government official and the governor of Puerto Rico, Ricardo Rosello, was leaked on the internet. This leak of this chat triggered a series of protests that took in place in multiple places, not only in Puerto Rico, but also in United States and other countries. The most intense periods of this protest lasted around two and a half weeks, where multiple social sectors and citizens formed groups that demonstrated mainly around the historic street of Old San Juan. It is important to mention that prior to the 2019 demonstration, Puerto Rican citizens and social organizations held protests in previous years against the incumbent government austerity policies. The Ricky Denuncia or the Telegram Gate in its context mean enough is enough. And the content of the chat reveals the commission of crimes of depravity, embezzlement of public funds, negligence in the line of duty, and illicit use of public works or services, among other action, violent actions against women and the LGBTIQ plus community. This protest occurred at a critical moment in which the country fight against the privatization and sale of public school system, a labor reform that hurts and diminishes the rights of employees, the reduction of policies of government agencies, um, the promotion of Puerto Rico as a tax heaven and countless tax incentives and exemptions granted to foreign agencies and organizations. And to this added is a town that suffers the mourning of 3,057 deaths or more, given the inefficiency of a government that did not know how to act or help 
in one of the greatest catastrophes that Puerto Rico faced, the Hurricane Maria. These and other actions by Ricardo Rosselló government, the mockery of the poverty and the most vulnerable sectors in the country triggered the multiple demonstration culminating in the resignation of Ricardo Rosselló on August 2, 2019. So the Ricky Denuncia project has gone through multiple phases since its inception. So in our first phase, we collected physical materials and digital materials for the preservation of, its, of this historic event. And then we created a website using Scalar to present the diversity of collected materials. Within the digital materials, Joel Blanco Rivera collected tweets from this event. And now the data set can be accessed through the Documenting the Now website. And we also compile related news. And with the help, with, with the help of volunteers, we managed to describe them. And this metadata is part of a collection that today can be accessed through Archived. Also, in our second phase, we were invited to collaborate with the professor Richard Marciano at the University of Maryland High School and the Advanced Information Collaboratory. And the objective of this collaboration was to develop educational materials so MLIS students can integrate methods related to computer science, as well as the analysis of big data to the work carried out in archive or libraries. From this collaboration, the team published Jupyter Notebooks on GitHub, and that is currently shows at the CASES website and is available to the general public. So in the Jupyter Notebook develop, students may learn how to capture Twitter data using Twerk, how to perform multimedia rating as a curatorial approach, and how to map Twitter data to a social media posting compliant RDF. In particular, I develop a computational notebook on curating Twitter data using schema.org or social media posting metadata schema. Twitter uses a proprietary metadata schema. This means that Twitter can change and it's changing its data representation structures. And in the long run, this affects how data scientists and software interacts with outdated formats. To avoid breaking Twitter policies, current practice is to store a list of tweets IDs that can be shared with others. However, the same policies include archiving practices and limit access depending on subscription. It is important to allow the content of the tweets quickly or you risk losing access to data since they can be deleted by the user or given the number of tweets that the user publishes, Twitter can make the decision to archive the tweet, making it invisible for other people, but not for the user who generated it. Unless um, special access is granted by the platform. And that this could mean uh, that they paid a subscription, they contacted the Twitter API team, or the account holder donated you the, the Twitter data. So Twitter policies do have restrictions on the ways that the data can be preserved for pros, prosper, prosperity or can be shared. By using Twitter embeddings as a way to display the tweet, we are convinced that our methodology falls into the fair, uh, fair use. Therefore, it is important not only to create the list of twist identifiers, but also to generate a curation that allows to standardize the data set and reach it and preserve it. So the main purpose of this curation that I am presenting, and that is using schema or social media posting metadata fields is to make accessible contextual content and relationships of the tweets that of the tweet that I said for non-data scientist audiences. By using social media posting metadata field, 
it develops a curation that can be applied to a tweet data set as a way to enrich the data set with additional metadata that can be used by a content management system to query context and relations. But first of all, why I decided to use RDF and why social media posting? So in RDF, what is seen is what is being recognized as metadata, meaning RDFA. An HTML document can be extended without affecting the representation to include a machine readable metadata mapping. This would allow content to be queryable by search engine and other software, for example, SparkQL. And also the Ricky Lenuncia project has collected other types of media that are displayed in different platforms. So our hope is that RDF can connect those uh, items that are displayed in different platforms. Also, RDF can recognize both the post and the media in that post as different archival objects. Why social media posting? Through the usage of is based on field, original tweets, quoted tweets, and retweets can maintain and make visible their relationships. Also, social media posting can represent posting that comes from different social media platforms. This uh, schema, although I haven't tried it, it can be applied to Facebook data, Instagram data, and other social media platforms. Another reason is that the variety of fields available allows assigning information to well-defined uh, metadata tags. So I decided to develop a metadata profile for tweets by incorporating uh, vocabulary from schema.org and generate the social media posting records representing tweets. I was able to identify nine metadata fields from social media posting that can be used to change the data set from proprietary schema to an RDF JSON LD format. I also was able to make annotation of the tweets by using metadata fields such as is based on, which allows me to represent the relation between retweets, the quoted tweets, the original tweets, and its share media. This is important because it adds context to how this piece was, how this piece of information impacted people, how people react to this piece of information and how it was shared within the Twitter community. So this is the explicit view of hierarchies by types, hierarchies, uh, RDF, uh, schema dog or hierarchies. So by treating each tweet as a separate file or piece of data, the metadata structure supports browsing, retrieving, and organizing of the content of the collection of tweets. So for a data scientist, it may be obvious the context and the relationship in the data set. But for other users, those relationships may not be apparent. My objective was to make this resources available to the general public and digital humanists through the content management system without using machine readability. This schema should enrich the CMS like Omeka with additional metadata that can be used to filter the collection, identify the subject terms. Also in the long run, using this public and generic standardized schema will allow users, researchers, and search engines to interact with preserved posts in a way that is different to how a big data, big data analyst would. So in here you can see a contrast of the proprietary schema, which is at the right, at the left, and social media posting schema at your right. So the research template created for this project attempt to preserve relevant information of the tweet object. For this project, it was relevant to have the user identifier, the tweet handle, the date of the tweet, text of the tweet, 
all of the hashtag. If it has user mentioned, it was really important for us. Uh, Twitter media. Um, if it was based out of another tweet, um, also the date retrieved and the date that it was accessed. So eventually using a CMS to represent social media posts would offer the opportunity to add an archival perspective to record. Adding classifications by topic and gender would not only not only to the post, but to the attached multimedia would offer visitors a curatorial experience closer to a museum exhibition. The statistic and trends report or marketing reports generated by data analysts do not offer the same experience. So a CMS would allow identifying connection between the post and other sources related to the same subject or event. In particular, the Ricky Renuncia project had received donations and multimedia records of physical objects currently kept by other institutions. So this record can also be included in the CMS and can be used to identify relationships between both social media posts and these objects. So again, the purpose of creating this RDF record was to use the, was to build a user-friendly search engine that could allow them to navigate an important incident and, and experience in social media. So further control vocabulary in schemas uh, could also be applied to offer filters tag not included in the original tweet JSON. Um, I want to invite you all to visit the project and also I want to give thank you for the uh, at the DCMI for allowing us to share uh, our different projects. Thank you. Great, thank you. Applause, applause. Yori, thank you very much. Uh, so I encourage folks to put questions into the chat or go ahead and raise a hand. If you're an attendee, I can very easily give you permission. Um, yes, Megan says, love the way context is added with the metadata. Um, that's definitely something that stands out uh, with your and with your, your choice uh, of that. Um, is based on uh, term, right? Um, did you did you consider other methods? So here's my question: Did you consider other methods for that, um, or was it, is that kind of your first? You know, did have you considered other methods, and why or why not are those favorable? So, so this has been a learning curve from learning how to extract or how to use Twitter day to how to use Twitter API to how to use Omega API. <laughs> so this is my first attempt with uh, this schema. Uh, I hope that as I am continue learning about metadata schemas in my PhD, I would be able to include uh, or see other types of implementations. Yeah, you're also definitely on the interoperability, uh, kind of a, a slightly different angle on it, but very much on that theme as well here, right? So how do you make these machine, how do you make the machines talk to each other in a useful way? Um, so I was happy to see you doing this mapping also out of the proprietary Twitter data into kind of a more um, open, well-documented set of terms. Um, and you showed some of your mapping there. Have you encountered particular challenges in that mapping, either in terms of just using the APIs or kind of more at the semantic level in develop in figuring out um, what the proper, um, what the right way to reflect the meaning is? I think my challenges were more related uh, to, to semantics. Um, what, what is the appropriate metadata tag for what type of data? Also, uh, there is a disconcern of what data are, uh, I am missing. 
and what data would be beneficial to the user and how that can that can map clearly to a social media posting or schema.org uh, uh, metadata metadata uh, metadata template. So um, for me, defining how I was going to use is based on and identifying in the JSON, Twitter JSON, what was a tweet, what was a retweet was one of the hardest part, especially because I'm also beginning to learn how to program. So navigating those and trying to find that really well. And also I noticed that you can to it based on you can add uh, more fields related to like user mentions. So how 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 you can structure that in a meaningful way was uh, challenging. Excellent. This sounds like a great learning experience for you. Uh, yes, it is. It's very very <laughs> impressive too. A very very uh, exciting project and and definitely worth documenting. Uh, so it's good to see kind of a um, you taking this more cultural heritage orientation towards documenting this and not simply treating it as kind of this social media thing, but thinking about how to bring it uh, to, to create more of an archival curated experience around it. Okay, uh, so uh, let's, I think we should uh, go move to our next presenter now. Uh, thank you, Irma-Marie. Applause. Uh, and we will move now to uh, our last presentation from Kylie Jolicoeur from Syracuse, Fresh Eyes, Fresh What's, How's and Why's. And uh, this it looks like some, some more interoperability discussion here in, 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 in certain ways. So take it away, Kylie. Thank you. Let me just get up and running here. Oh, having a little bit of an issue. Sorry, give me one second. All right, can you folks see that okay? Yep, looks okay, great. Perfect, thank you. So as she said, my name is Kylie Jolliker. Um, I'm a MLIS student at Syracuse University uh, School of Information Studies. I also work as a graduate student assistant for the digital library program in our newly minted Department of Digital Stewardship at the Syracuse University Libraries. I've been in this role since February 2020. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is one of the projects that I've undertaken this year as part of that role. Before I get started, I also want to acknowledge as a member of the Syracuse University community, uh, with respect the Onondaga Nation, the Firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral land Syracuse University now stands. So Syracuse University Libraries recently acquired uh, the digital collections platform Cortex. Uh, we oversee the management implementation of this platform, and we began our actual migration of assets in test collections in early 2021. Uh, by June of this summer, we began actually migrating in earnest, uh, but we're still using the collections as we move them to test different workflows and features. One of the collections that we migrated was the Garrett Smith pamphlets and broadsides, which are, you guessed it, a collection of pamphlets and broadsides authored by Garrett Smith, who was a prominent New York abolitionist and politician. Um, on the left here is a portrait of Garrett Smith from the holdings of uh, SUL Special Collections Research Center, the SCRC. Um, and then in the middle here is an image of the first page of a pamphlet authored by Smith um, from the same collection. And then we also have two other collections uh, related to Garrett Smith. And on the far right here uh, is a letter authored by him um, from the Garrett Smith Papers Collection. So these two other collections were definitely in dialogue with this project. They had already been migrated, but neither of them were cataloged. Um, so they were you know, in, in that dialogue, but they did not have mark records to be transformed as part of this project. So the project itself was to take the existing mark catalog records of the pamphlets and broadsides collection that described the physical objects in the collection and then the uh, metadata from our METS manager um, for the existing digital objects 
and transform them to fit our Cortex metadata application profile that was developed specifically for this new platform. The METS records had a level of detail that was comprehensive enough to describe the objects in a way that allowed them to be easily distinguished as unique, um, but the MARC records were far more thoroughly constructed. They had a much higher level of detail, um, but that being said, their limitation was that they only described the physical objects and not the digital objects, which is why we needed also the METS manager metadata. Part of the purpose of this project was to test our application profile that we were developing. Um, I've been assisting Deirdre Joyce, our head of the digital stewardship um, and digital library program in designing. Credit for the heavy lifting definitely goes to Deirdre. Um, the application profile really proved to be particularly well suited to this kind of transformation um, because it was designed with an emphasis on semantic operation and it can be transformed um, with Dublin Core in any number of ways to suit the syntactic needs of any programs or mechanisms that we might be using to export or harvest our metadata in the future. And for the transformation itself, I used Open or Find. Um, this is what the MARC records look like, just to kind of give everyone an idea of how they came out. Uh, we took the binary MARC export from the catalog, uh, we used MARC edit to create MRK files, and we uploaded them into Open or Find. This is what it looked like. It was all vertically. All of the data was stuck in a single column. I split the records by field, turned them into columns. So it pivoted the whole spreadsheet into something like this. At this point, the METS metadata had already been incorporated. Um, there was a lot that I kind of took from the METS metadata, but there was also a lot that I left out. So I don't have a good picture of kind of the in-between, but this is close to the final stage um, of the cleaned data. So. You know, there's some irregularities in this photo because it was still very much a working a working process at this point when I took this. Um, so the column names and stuff are a little wonky, but this is part of the, the process close to the end. This is the mapping that I ended up with uh, from the Merck um, data, the METS manager metadata, and then our uh, application profile fields. There are additional notes in the internal document as well, kind of relating to working questions and stuff that I took out. Um, but we're kind of still working with this as we work out how to apply this to other collections as we move forward, because we do have other collections that were cataloged and have MARC records. So as you can see from this, uh, we ended up adding application profile fields for alternate title and for BIP IDs, alternate titles because we have other collections that have alternate titles and it had been left off of our application profile because none of the collections that we migrated before this had it, so it wasn't on kind of the forefront of our thinking. Um, and bib IDs, because again, we have other cataloged collections and moving forward, we can use those bib IDs to create links back to the catalog records for users to view that full mark record. The uh, mapping of these fields really led us to several reconsiderations along the way. Again, very iterative process. We're still testing, we're still learning from this. Um, we updated our metadata dictionary and best practices guide, which is a big document um, full of our, you know, um, definitions of, of different terms and best practices of how to apply things. Um, and this included how we address event headings from FAST and VF, um, how we format publisher information, and some clarifications of what should be assigned to physical description versus to description, um, to just give you an idea of some of those changes. Plus, we just improved bits here and there, you know, as we go through this, and we learn more, more things that we might stumble over, we add that to the document as well. It's very much an evolving document. So this transformation itself isn't particularly novel, but that being said, I think it still fits our topic well because it's reasonably common or at least fits a, fits a pattern that's reasonably common for us. And I think that really makes it valuable. Um, I had the perspective of undertaking this project without any prior knowledge of MARC transformation um, or established practices in doing so. I was, of course, familiar with MARC records. I was familiar with our METS metadata, but I did not have experience doing this kind of work. Um, time constraints prevented us from allowing me to actually embark on contextual research, but we also understood that this was probably a benefit because I would be going into this without any of those kind of prior assumptions, preconceived notions. So I was really looking at this fresh. Um, because of this, I was able to not only create our, our mark mapping for this collection that can be 
were used with adjustment on other collections moving forward because I wasn't just looking at this specifically, but I was thinking about other applications as well. And I also considered a three-part assessment workflow that could benefit you know, myself um, and other professionals that might be new to metadata transformation um, to evaluate decisions that we make as we transform metadata, whether it's specifically mark transformation or otherwise as well. So I broke this down into what, how, and why. Um, and for this project, the assessment workflow presented itself with these components. And of course, this would be a little bit larger with other things considered too. But for the what, um, you know, what, what mark fields are represented? What do we actually have here? Uh, what fields do we have to work with in the application profile that we're moving towards? Uh, what's missing was a big one, you know, what either in the mark metadata, the best metadata, or in the application profile itself. So it kind of went both ways. Uh, for the how, how could each specific mark field be mapped to our application profile fields? Um, how might any of these influences, um, how, might, how might any of these uses influence their semantic function? How could some data in separate mark fields be combined to share an application profile field? And you know, conversely, how could they be pulled apart to fit multiple fields? Because it's definitely not a one-to-one -one transformation. And then the why here, I kind of added in a, you know, a linear progression because it looks nice as a heading, um, but I definitely think that we can reimagine it as, as another gear in our system here because these things are, are not just one and then the next and then the next. You kind of have to go through the process all together. Um, it, definitely bridges, it definitely bridges the what and the how. Um, so for the why, um, it provides justification and reasoning behind why a particular decision is made, which is especially important when you're working as part of a team. Um, things need to be documented and shared. Um, and then, you know, multiple uh, solutions may present themselves. And then um, again, documenting the why uh, for decisions um, will help others recreate it. And as this is passed on, um, this mapping, it will help others employ it as well. So, a little ironically, um, for the sake of brevity in the presentation, I've decided to discuss mostly the what and the how, but I think part of the why of why I decided that this um, assessment workflow that I used was important came because as I was thinking about this, I was like, okay, well, I'm just reiterating, you know, an obvious common sense approach. And then when I started thinking about that, I realized that there's a big problem there. And I think that myself thinking that is definitely indicative of how common it is to think that. Um, and I would definitely argue that we too often end up with an attitude towards the assessment step of projects as, as we do them, as we plan them, um, that it kind of ends up like this. What, like it's hard? So the thing that I want to close with of why I really decided that I was you know, going to submit this to DCMI and why I was really excited that I got the chance to present is because when we think about things as common sense, so even if it's something like metadata transformation, saying that something is common sense really assumes a set of experiences and a thought process that's the same as one's own. And I think that's really important, especially when we have students working on projects. I mean, I currently am a student. Um, and what is obvious to someone is often developed through experience. So having a set of basic guidelines, even something as, as common sense as a what, a how, and a why can help professionals, especially either early in their career or who are doing this for the first time, uh, develop their best practices as they gain that experience. Something that's even just outwardly simple is going to help new professionals um, and remind experienced professionals of those kind of basic workflows that they can employ in their framework. And my kind of last thought about this is that basics are basics for a reason, not because they're easy, but because they're foundational. Great, thank you, Kylie. Applause, applause. Uh, so I see one hand up from Megan Calhoun. Do you have a question, Megan? Uh, yeah, I didn't feel like typing it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thanks, Kylie. That was great. Um, I really like the bit at the end about um, the obvious isn't necessarily obvious and understanding that I think we can really relate to it on our end when it, we came down to we're trying to build this metadata and then we had to back it up and back it up like, wait a minute, what even is outdoor sculpture, you know, and then we had like, what is sculpture? We have to define this before we can even do any of the rest of this stuff. So yeah, that was, we can definitely relate on that front. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that experience. 
Yeah, other questions? Very welcome. Uh, oh, yeah, here we go. Sorry, Jan, I just... Okay, I re-enabled you. <laughs> you should be able to talk now, I think. There you go. Okay. Uh, yes. It's my turn? Okay. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> uh, hi, Kylie or Kelly? Kylie, I guess. Uh, um, thanks for a great presentation. And um, I uh, sort of know uh, the project you're talking about, but um, I do have a question about the, uh, um, the mark record. So uh, I know uh, the mark record for the archival collection is at the finding aid level, is that correct? For this one, it was specifically done at the object level. We do have some that are at kind of the collection level, but this one specifically, every pamphlet and broadside had its own individual mark record. Oh, okay, okay. This is the one place I, I you know, uh, I wasn't very clear about. So you, you, you did have the individual mark records for the pamphlets in that uh, archival collection. Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. That's all, that answers um, all. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I had a similar reaction of, well, I guess I was surprised to hear that um, the mark records were mostly about physical objects, right? Which is contrary to how they often appear in library contexts. Um, but if it's for in archival sort of uh, applications, it, that is more, I guess, or feasible. Um, so yeah, yeah. yeah that's I, what... I just, oh, I'm sorry. Oh no, go ahead. Okay. Now I was. Uh... It just remind me, you know, uh, Karen's comments remind me about the BYD that you, you know, in in your uh, mapping, uh, you know, cross mapping uh, map. Um, that one does that, um, or is it going to be uh, used for uh, like digital equivalent? Um, for example, pamphlets might be digitized, and would that be by the be used for linking the digital uh, counterparts for the physical item? We're applying it to the digitized item in the um, digital asset manager so that users can use it to link back to the uh, mark record that's actually in the catalog on the SUL website. So we're not using it to actually represent the digital object, but we're using it to kind of allow users to connect the two. If they're looking for more of the mark metadata that we didn't bring over because some of it is so specific to the physical object that we did not bring it over to represent the physical, um, I'm sorry, the digital object as well, because we do have notes, um, you know, about what, what is the physical object, what's its condition, what are some things about it, because you can see it reflected in the digitized version, but right. there was other information that we didn't bring over. So we made sure that we linked them, that way a user could very easily find that if they're looking for a little bit more information. And especially mm -hmm. because we um, changed all of our headings to FAST instead of Library of Cong Congress subject headings. So those, again, are then represented by the MARC record. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, I have another question. <laughs> Am I allowed to ask so many questions? <laughs> um, so the um, to to transform the mark data to the mats. Oh, I forgot the the whole name for for that application profile. So, what do you have planned to use that transformed metadata mark or mark data to? fit into some new applications or user uh, interface? The mapping itself or the data that we mapped? The data you mapped. So all of that is going on uh, the digital asset manager. Um, it's not launched yet, unfortunately. We're still, we're still working on it, but it's, it's coming soon. I'm really excited. Um, mm -hmm. And each of the actual mappings that we did, we did it on an object level. 
So all of that is coming over to represent the object in the digital asset manager. So all of that that we pulled from both the MARC records and the existing kind of legacy METS metadata that was also transformed will all be there as the uh, descriptive metadata on those objects. Mm -hmm. Will there be uh, the metadata? Uh, yeah, it's already in, in the catalog system since they are in MARC format. So. Mm -hmm. I would imagine uh, the catalog interface will be able to provide access to uh, those mapped metadata or the mock data. Yes, I'm not sure what um, a future state will look like in terms of kind of pulling it from the digital asset manager into the catalog. I'm not sure we have this new platform and because it's so new, we're still working on some of its features. I'm not sure what that will look like for us. Um, I know that it does have capabilities along those lines, but that's definitely something that's that's future state for us that we haven't necessarily considered yet. Thank you very much. That's Thank you. very uh, informative. Okay. Oh, Marcia, go ahead. Hi. Thank you so much, everyone. And um, this is our first student forum in the DCMI conference uh, how do you feel that you would like to see this kind of exchange i also uh, wonder because all of you reported your real experience in practicum or library or archives and or across for example our ohio project is also dealing with what how museums document this do you feel that uh, the high school students who would like to go into this profession should take a practicum or project directly working with librarians, with the professionals, um, or they just don't need to uh, just take the courses? So what is your tips after this? <laughs> so and anyone can give us some uh, suggestions because do you see my yeah, also has that's a, open to, that's that's for all participants right marcia that's a this is yeah. open now yeah so i think megan perhaps would like to say something uh, well i would just best say i definitely find the uh, practical um experience extremely extremely helpful um because when you're talking in class, it's always, you know, best case scenario. And um, when the reality, when the, you know, the rubber hits the road, the reality is going to be a little bit different and you need to know what to base your decisions on when that happens. And perfection is not going to be the outcome, but, you know, making it really usable with the context of reality. So. Um, Great points. Thank you, Megan. And Gigi? Yeah, I think that, so to just um, echo, I agree with what Megan just said, but I also think, so for me, um, Dr. Chin was my professor for my undergrad, for not my undergrad, for my, uh, for my metadata class, and um, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure she doesn't remember this, but what gave me, what kind of provided kindling for my interest in metadata was um, a project we did towards the end of 616, which is that class, um, which delved into Library of Congress subject headings. And at that point, I was brand new to librarianship. And it's and Kylie's smiling because she knows exactly how important this became to me. Um, and so it then turned it and spiraled into trying, kind of trying to find the fire to light the kindling, I guess, to use an analogy. Um, I always thought I was going to be a reference librarian. Um, I always, <laughs> thanks, Dr. Chin. Um, I always thought I was going to be a reference librarian. I always thought that I was going to work in an academic library and do maybe subject matter. Um, and then finding a project that kind of spoke to the fact that metadata has so much impact on our lives. Um, that was really fundamental to kind of pushing me down this path um, because 
we learn we learn a lot in in class, but you really um, you really don't get to apply it as much because and I think Heather brought this up at one point. Um, you're given kind of a structure that you're working within. Um, like, you know, you have to you have to submit an assignment or you have to have this kind of you have to kind of learn these kinds of records. Whereas like once you're in the real world, you kind of have a little bit more freedom to freedom to explore with what it means to do metadata. So um, I think it would be very beneficial to have some kind of structured within an iSchool curriculum, a structured way to explore using that as a practicum. Um, however, that might appear, because I think that's the other thing is these don't always appear very obviously as metadata opportunities. Um, like they might have metadata listed, but they don't ever appear in in the way that, you know, it's just like here, come here to do a metadata record for the first time. So um, yes, I think to uh, to Dr. Zhang's question, yes. Thank you, Kylie. Yeah. I'm in agreement with both Gigi and Megan. Um, I think that it is it, in in any aspect of librarianship. I do think it's it's vital. I do think it's worth discussing at the same time that there are difficulties with even a program like ours that does have an internship requirement that a lot of internships are unpaid, which makes it very difficult for students who are then paying to receive the credits, but the work is unpaid. And of course, it can be very difficult to find placements too, because we all know librarians are very overworked. So it, there are definitely difficulties with it, but I do think that it is worth it as long as we're you know discussing and managing those difficulties. And I think about kind of echoing what Gigi just said. I started in January of 2020 at the iSchool and I started applying for jobs. And I was like, okay, like if, if I'm gonna be here and I'm in this program, I really need a job. So when the DLP job opened up, I was like, okay, this sounds really interesting. I don't know anything about archives. I don't know anything about like digital <laughs> stewardship or any of this, but it sounds really interesting. And so eventually when I received that, that acceptance to that position, I was able, you know, to, to use prior work experience, my prior career before this. And it helped me understand that there was so much more to librarianship than I ever thought there was. And there's so much more to archives than I ever thought there was. So I mean, it really, like Gigi just said, like certain things just open up a whole new world for you. And it really helps you understand things in a way that classroom learning definitely gives you a foundation for. And it definitely introduces you to, or maybe helps you continue to kind of build on. But I think that practical component is definitely and frankly invaluable part of learning. Thanks, Kylie. Kathy, you have a comment? Um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to add, um, I know someone had touched on this earlier a little bit about working on the project helped them to sort of account for the user end a little bit more. And I definitely feel like your the classwork is helpful, but when we were working on the Ohio Outdoor Sculpture Database, there was a little bit more understanding of like, well, what are the users going to be really looking for? And what is our website going to look like? And what, what kinds of things are actually useful? And it just helps to bring in the uh, users needs a little bit more to reality. The other thing that I would say is really valuable about the internship experience was working with people outside of the school and outside of maybe classes I had taken um, and, and other um, things that just sort of work in together with what we were trying to do. One of the things we got to do was talk to the person who is in charge of helping, who was in charge of helping to set up the Omeka database and he had sort of you know runs it behind the scenes and he's going to help to create a new website for us and so that created this whole extra project for us that we needed to not only think about what our metadata standards were and go out and find sculptures to to catalog and then we also wanted to think about how are we going to make this look better and be easier to use so having that contact both with Bill, our supervisor, who was not a part of our university, and also the person who would be working on the comp more computer intensive end, I think was really valuable just 
to have to think of a project from multiple angles and just having contact with people outside of our you know just the professors we know from our classes so it's sort of like a networking aspect and just that whole experience of getting the whole range of the project i definitely think the internship was um a good a very good thing to do okay great question marcia really got us going in our wrap-up q a uh, thank you to everyone and also i know that cassie and the megan will volunteer continually on this uh, project and supervise other volunteer students for intern in the future. So this may be become a workflow for how you can have help the whole community get much stronger and like you said, user friendly. Um, right. Uh, yeah, I think in the classroom, we tend to separate sort of users, right? Like we sort of tend to, or at least in a lot of LIS curricula, sort of treat it a little bit separately, which lets you dive into some foundational concepts and has some advantages. But when you're going to work, you're going to be, you need, you need to find ways to bring them together. And it seems like the, um, yeah, this kind of experience really does that. Yeah, or do you see my has a education committee, uh, which has so far the two students representative there, Nisha is there. And so if any of you are also interested in as a student or as a former student <laughs> or um, as a practitioner, if you are interested in anything, um, just email me or and Dr. Jen Chin and Karen. Um, mm -hmm. We can consider maybe there could be another interest group to form and task group. We have eight task groups so far. Yeah, so, we have a lot of task groups. Yeah. Okay. I really hope we will get together again and then um, move on. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. Um, thank you, everyone. I think we can we'll we'll wrap it up at this point. It's been a great session. It's been great to hear about these projects and all the work on it. And um, I just like to thank all of our um, attendees and all of our panelists. And let's do a big round of applause. And uh, great job, everyone. And it's been great to meet you all at least virtually today. Uh, so thank you, everyone.